extraordinary news. SpaceX has posted a 40-minute video of a talk that Elon recently gave at Starbase, detailing all kinds of interesting info about Starship for us to pick apart. And as if that wasn't enough, Booster 11 here was rolled to the production site, completed its engine testing ahead of Flight 4, and is seemingly slated to be rolled back to the production site probably by the time you watch this. That's just how fast SpaceX is moving here. And on top of all of that, we spotted some really interesting development hardware for Starship outside of the Star Factory, so you know we're going to talk about that. Howdy, Star fans. I'm Jack Beyer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update, sponsored by Novium. Let's start over at the Massey Outpost, where there's some interesting new structures being assembled. As you can see here, SpaceX looks to be assembling a new stand of some kind. It's hard to tell how it will work, or even if that's what it will be used for, but one thing is for certain, it will be massive. Maybe this is the beginning of a new structural test stand, similar to the old can crusher that we've seen in action so many times before. Peeking through the buildings here, we can see the new ship static fire stand, which is to be used in conjunction with the flame trench that SpaceX has been diligently building at Massey's. Along with the flame trench, SpaceX has continued to build out an entire methane tank farm and a water deluge tank farm for the massive flame bucket that will be installed inside the trench. This stand appears to still be a ways from being operational but it'll be really cool to see once fully completed. And more importantly, it's going to be integral in allowing SpaceX to increase their testing cadence for both boosters and ships and ultimately launches. It'll free up the suborbital side of the launch site for the second tower and orbital pad and enable even faster cadence of booster and ship testing and ultimately launches. Now, as veteran tank watchers will know, there's an old saying here in Starbase and that is that work continues on the orbital launch mount. Well, the same goes for Star Factory, as work on Star Factory continues. Construction crews are adding glass mounts for the large corner of glass that the Star Factory is going to get over the next few weeks. An interesting note, however, is a large doorway out of the taller section of the Star Factory that has appeared. Right here, we can see the outline of the doorway that will face towards Mega Bay 2 and where the old ring yard was located. A potential purpose for a door this tall is that SpaceX might stack ship sections before rolling them to Mega Bay 2 for final stacking. Right now, ships are stacked in six separate sections from the nose cone down, requiring five welds. By pre-stacking sections inside the Star Factory, SpaceX might be able to reduce that to three main welds by preemptively stacking sections inside the Star Factory. Speaking of stacking vehicles, Booster 14's methane tank was completed just before both bridge cranes were needed to lift Booster 11 and prepare it for rollout, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Booster 14 now only needs one final stacking to be complete. However, once stacked, there is a lot more work to be done before it can be ready for cryogenic proof testing. This booster is currently slated to be paired with Ship 32 and would be used for Starship Flight 7. However, Ship 32 has been sitting in the Rocket Garden since January 11th of this year. If a one and a half month orbital launch mount turnaround were to be the norm for the pad, then Flight 7 wouldn't take place until at least October or later. This video was sponsored by Novium. They make really cool magnetically hovering pens, which are a great addition to any workspace. Plus, they're a great gift for anyone you might care about. Weightlessness is one of the most exciting things about spaceflight to me, and one of the things about it that I would most like to experience. Novium hover pens are inspired by space, and are a great, artful way to have a little reminder of the coolness of weightlessness in your workplace. I don't know about you, but I really like to have things on my desk that inspire my curiosity and my creativity, and that make my brain happy. The Interstellar Edition has a tilt of 23.5 degrees, reminiscent of the Earth's axis of rotation. It's available in several great colors like Space Black and Mars Magma. Plus, there are premium editions made with 18 karat gold, and they have a real meteorite embedded in them. I personally really like the look of the Future Edition, which features an interchangeable tip, so you can have a rollerball or a fountain pen tip and switch back and forth easily as desired. I mean, just look at it. What's not to like? Hover pens are not only high-end pens that provide an excellent writing experience, but they just look so dang cool. Use code NSF to get 10% off, plus free shipping on all hover pens. Use the link in the description so Novium knows we sent you. Thanks again to Novium for sponsoring this video and 
for making a cool product. SpaceX continues to roll along with prepping more and more vehicles for flight as Ship 30 was rolled to Mega Bay 2. Once in the new bay, Ship 30 was then placed on the newly built work stand to receive its engines and any other work needed for its upcoming engine test campaign. If the Starship program goals hold and Ship 29 can complete its in-space burn, Ship 30 could be the first Starship to enter orbit. If Ship 30 can make it to orbit, then the next ship, Ship 31, might even carry a payload. Ship 31 has been receiving more and more attention lately as SpaceX is clearly trying to have several flights lined up and ready to go simultaneously. Ship 31 and its partner in crime, Booster 13, have not yet completed cryogenic proof testing at Massey's. This could be because the vehicles aren't ready yet, or as we discussed a moment ago, SpaceX doesn't want to interrupt the construction of the Massey's static fire Stand. As you may have seen in the most recent daily and in pictures from Mary, teams have been taking a ton of tiles off of Ship 29. Now, a lot of the tiles being removed and reinstalled are the tiles that use adhesive rather than the pins to be held on. Once these tiles are taken off, SpaceX is going in and cleaning the area and roughing the area up, like you can see here being done on the tip of its nose cone. This is done to allow the adhesives to stick to the metal better, which will allow the tiles to better stay on the vehicle. SpaceX is going over this heat shield with a fine tooth comb, ensuring it is in the best shape possible. Flight 4 needs to improve on the successes of Flight 3 and make it through re-entry with its attitude under control. And SpaceX clearly wants to give Ship 29 the best possible chance to do so. Now let's talk about Ship 29's other half, Booster 11. SpaceX has just completed the rollout, testing, and rollback of a booster in less than a week, which is crazy, so let's go through it. Early in the week, on April 2nd, we had the first indications of possible testing when a road closure was published for Friday, April 5th. This road closure started at 8 a.m. and ended at 8 p.m., but would later be changed to 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. as crews would need a little more time to prepare. On this same day, a parade of water trucks rolled into the launch site to fill up the water deluge system, which is needed for a static fire test yet another clue of what was to come. Once this was filled up, SpaceX cleared out the orbital launch pad to purge all of the propellant lines ahead of testing. SpaceX does this to make sure no debris gets into the vehicle, like what happened with Booster 4. This would also be the first time the orbital tank farm was fully spooled up since Flight 3. Then, early in the morning of April 3rd, a booster transport stand was moved to the Mega Bay in preparation for moving Booster 11 to the launch pad. Only hours later, road delays were posted to allow for SpaceX to move Booster 11 to the launch site, which teams then did that night. Booster 11 was lifted onto the orbital launch mount in the early morning hours of April 4th, only 21 days after Booster 10 left the pad during Flight 3. This is a fantastic reduction in turnaround time for SpaceX, as its teams continue to work to reduce refurbishment time on the orbital launch pad. Teams then quickly finished up preparing the launch pad for a static fire test, and all of the scaffolding on the launch mount was removed on the morning of April 5th. Then only one day after being lifted onto the orbital launch mount, Booster 11 completed what we think is a successful 33 engine static fire, which lasted for around seven or eight seconds. SpaceX tweeted just stating that this is the booster static fire ahead of Flight 4. This probably means that it was a full 33 engines and that there were no issues. And then as if to just show off how crazy efficient SpaceX has become, while the booster was detanking, a pair of road delays were posted, indicating that the booster would be rolled back to the production site. To reiterate, SpaceX has turned around the orbital launch pad after Flight 3 and gotten it ready for a static fire test of a booster in just 22 days. How many other rockets in the world can make that claim, besides Falcon 9, let alone the world's largest rocket of all time? Now here is where the fun begins. Over the last few days, SpaceX has rolled out of the Star Factory some interesting new barrel sections. These are development articles, as one of the labels says, and have no assigned ship number. So let's break down some changes that can be seen and what this may mean for version 2 of Starship should this development design be used. First, we can see the payload bay door cutout, which is different from what is currently on Ship 29 through Ship 32. This door cutout is symmetrical, with half-circle ends, contrary to the older design, which has straight-cut corners near the bottom of the ends, as seen here. Another noticeable change with this cutout is that it is now directly above the payload bay door hatch. Currently, there's a full ring between the payload bay hatch and the door. 
with this move, the payload bay door would move down about one and a half rings in the payload bay section. Yes, one and a half rings, since the cutout is now sitting on a weld line rather than in the middle of a ring. But this could also mean that the payload bay is shorter and the tanks are getting bigger. We'll just have to wait and see. In order to make room for this move, the payload bay hatch, which is an ellipse, was turned 90 degrees to be horizontal, giving a bit more room for the door cutout. Just below this door will be the forward dome, where SpaceX has most of the avionics and the hookups for the methane tank pressurization system, as seen with these junctions here. Along with the new location for the payload door, there is a large cutout for what is very similar to the chopstick lift point cutouts that, up to this point, have been up on the nose cone. With these cutouts appearing on the payload bay section, it is possible that SpaceX might be looking to move lift point locations ahead of stretching the ship. However, these could also be cutouts for an extra set of roll thrusters to be added to the vehicle. These are located below the payload bay door in this new design, which would mean that the stabilizer points would move down to around the ship's common dome. And last but not least, this section is only three rings tall, while the payload bay currently being used is a total of five rings tall. This could mean a change in stacking operations for the vehicle, or SpaceX decided to just test this out on a shorter barrel section. Okay, so that was a lot of little bits of information, but what does it all mean? Well, SpaceX seems to want to condense the payload bay and possibly add a larger PEZ dispenser inside for more Starlinks. Teams might also be preparing for the inevitable stretching of the ship by lowering the lift points now instead of later to get ahead of coming upgrades. Regarding other possible changes with ship version 2, we'll have to wait and see what SpaceX comes up with. Hopefully, they will be kind enough to show us early glimpses of this, with more development sections rolling out of the factory. But thankfully, we don't exactly have to wait long for pieces to come out of the Star Factory for us to analyze for Starship version 2, and that is because SpaceX, as I mentioned at the start of the video, released a 40-minute talk by Elon as we were finishing this script and I was getting ready to come out here and record. And in this talk, Elon mentions not only Starship version 2, but Starship version 3 as well. So let's pick apart all of the details that we were able to figure out. Remember a moment ago when I said this is where the fun begins? I lied. This is where the fun begins. First of all, Elon did not talk about what happened during Flight 3 and what caused the failures of both Ship 28 and Booster 10. At at least not in the video that SpaceX released. So unfortunately, we'll have to wait for the mishap investigation to be completed to know more about what happened there. Next, let's talk about upcoming launch pads. SpaceX currently has plans to have a launch pad at the Cape operational by mid-2025. Although, that could be more of an Elon time thing. We'll just have to wait and see. Along with LC-39A, at least one more launch tower is planned at the Cape, and we'll see when they get to building that. Something of note to this is that we can see that there is a major redesign in progress at LC-39A, but Elon never mentioned anything about it, thus leaving it to our imagination what this redesign will end up looking like. With these two launch pads at the Cape, and the two pads at Starbase, that'll make four launch pads total for Starship to be up and running in the next few years. Also, in all of this launch pad planning, Elon mentioned that SpaceX still has plans for sea launch platforms, which is quite surprising given that they gave up on the old ocean platforms two years ago. Yes, they sold Phobos and Deimos for scrap, but let's be honest, trying to develop sea-based platforms before you've even launched once from land was probably not a good idea to begin with. But despite the ocean platforms mentioned, there was no mention of Starship point-to-point, -point, and that made Chris Bergen sad. So DM him pictures of horses, because we all know Chris Bergen likes horses. During the presentation, Elon also reiterated that Flight 4 is slated to be ready to launch in about a month or so pending the closing of the FAA mishap investigation. Elon talked about how the plan for Flight 4 is to have Booster 11 land on a virtual tower, which is presumably an imaginary tower in the Gulf of Mexico, which would simulate the burn needed for catching a booster. He also said that if this simulated landing were to be successful, SpaceX would try to attempt a catch on Flight 5. However, it's unclear what SpaceX will do should Flight 4's virtual capt attempt go less than okay. For example, imagine it lands okay, but perhaps not perfectly. Will SpaceX try again, or will they just send it and try a catch anyways? Well, that's going to be an epic thing to find out when we get there, that's for sure. Well, I cannot wait to see catch attempts begin, and I can't wait to find out when the first one will happen, so we'll just have to stay tuned and see. In the same update, SpaceX gave us a render of what the catching may look like, and I gotta say, it looks insane. From the angle the booster approaches the pad, to the deceleration, to the swing over the arms, it's just crazy looking. 
if you think about it, if SpaceX can pull this off, there's a chance they will already be reusing boosters by next year. When it comes to ship catching though, Elon said that's a bit further down the line. The goal for Flight 4 would be to get the ship through re-entry and survive the plasma heating phase. After that, we already have seen the paperwork indicating that SpaceX will be trying soft landings on the ocean. Elon mentioned that at least two successful soft landings on the ocean will be required before a ship catch can be attempted back on land. This means we won't see a ship catch this year, but Elon says it's definitely happening in 2025. SpaceX was also kind enough to give us a graphic showing us Starship version 2 and even Starship version 3. According to Elon, the current version of Starship is only capable of 40 to 50 tons to low Earth orbit, which is kind of insane to think that even with how powerful Raptor is, SpaceX still has a lot of work to do in order to get this vehicle where they want it. On the other hand, this version is in full reuse mode, meaning that we have a ship with tiles, flaps, and so on, and a booster also reserved propellant for a return to Earth. Without all of that, Starship probably would have a lot more performance, but then it wouldn't be reusable in the first place. After the current version will be Starship version 2, which will increase to what we had thought Starship was already at in terms of capacity, which is 100 plus tons to low Earth orbit. Starship 2 will be only slightly taller than the current version of Starship, and the thrust will also be higher, from 7,130 tons to 8,240 tons. This would mean that in the current Starship, SpaceX runs the engines at 216 tons of thrust each, while on version 2, they'll run at 250 tons each. In the diagram, we can also see changes to the interstage, changes to the ship flaps, and a bunch of other stuff. We'll probably have to do a deep dive into all of this because there's a lot of interesting details details to gather here. The slide also included information for Starship version 3, which is supposed to be capable of 200 plus tons to orbit, reusable, with booster liftoff thrust of 10,000 tons. The rocket will also be taller and will incorporate the Raptor 3 engine, which we'll talk about shortly. While all of that information was great, we really don't have any information on the timelines, which vehicles might be version 2 and then version 3, and we also don't know when we're going to start seeing them fly. But I guess we'll just figure it out when that happens. During the presentation, Elon also showed a slide comparing the different versions of Raptor. Raptor will also be getting a new upgrade in the future, which is Raptor 3, and that'll be capable of 280 tons of thrust compared to the 230 tons of thrust for Raptor 2. Elon said, eventually, they'd like to have Raptor engines running at over 330 tons of thrust, which is already an insane number to think about for an engine of this size. Just like we saw with the transformation between Raptor 1 and Raptor 2, Raptor 3 will be much more simplified, with integrated cooling channels instead of a bunch of pipes going all around in different places. Unfortunately, Elon did not mention during the presentation how many Raptor 3s have been built, how many have been fired, and when we can expect to see it integrated on a vehicle. But either way, some tantalizing details here. So yes, we got this amazing info dump from SpaceX and Elon and all the cool new renders and everything, but there's almost more questions now than we had before. Hopefully we get some more details in the future from Elon or another SpaceX official. But either way, you can stay tuned by watching our videos or our 24-7 live streams from McGregor, from here in Starbase, or from the Cape. Thanks again to Novium for sponsoring this video. And don't forget to use the code NSF to get 10% off and free shipping, or go to the link in the description. That's gonna be it for the Starbase update, and a wrap to an incredibly exciting week as we get closer and closer to Flight 4. Thank you for watching, and as always, don't forget, be excellent to each other.